Hi there, so I thought today we should have a look at Nier Automata. It's one of my favorite games in recent memory, uh, mainly because it's uh, just a super game all around the story and all that stuff, but also the interface, which is why I picked this for this video. I think it's a very easy task for this video to just demonstrate how well developed this interface is, or the graphical interface, I will just shorten this interface, uh, is in this game, uh, both in terms of functionality and uh, aesthetics, uh, presentation, it's just so, f it fits so well in with the game. Uh, I think most of the, if not everything, of the interface is actually part of the fiction in the game, so it's all integrated into the story and, uh, and you can see it uh, being affected by whatever's happening inside the game as well. So like if there's a like uh, if there's some some distortion happening inside the game, like in the soundscape or the visuals, uh, this also reflects in how the interface works. And uh, there's this amazing sequence at the end of the game, which I can't show because it spoils everything. Ah, oh, but it's so good how I, how it uses interface uh, in that sequence. Uh, but I can't show this. Uh, but yeah, you should play the game if you haven't played it at least that far. Get all the endings, it's uh, such an amazing game, okay. And there's also other ways how the interface plays into the fiction, like uh, you can take out HUD elements, like the overlays with a health bar and uh, and so on, out the interface to uh, give yourself more CPU power to delegate into attack chips or defense chips. Uh, it does really a lot of brilliant stuff, stuff like this with the interface, and I just really like it. So in this video, I'm just going to go through uh, how this stuff works. So we can uh, go to the game and open the main menu. And if you go to skills and plugin chips. So the way chips works in Nier Automata is that each chip has different statistical boosts and, uh, and such. So uh, if uh, you look to the column on the right here, there's some stats that changes based on which chips I'm currently using. If I go into the custom and uh, system chips, I can... Uh, so here's a fun one. Like, I can remove the OS chip and uh, it will immediately cause my death in the game. It's, uh, it's so... Uh, it's stupid fun that they actually include this in the game, so I can just go in and take out that chip. So here are some HUD chips. So because of how the uh, chips work, like every chip takes away a certain amount of points from the CPU um, power that I have. And you can see this in the numbers on the right side of um, this, um, this selected item. There's a number two there, here's number one. So if I remove this one, the XP will XP gauge will rem disappear from the HUD in the game. I can do the same thing with the HP gauge. I can also remove the skill gauge. Let's just remove a bunch of HUD elements here. Remove the minimap. Remove the objectives. I can remove the damage values. They're not. Yeah, I don't really need those right now. And then I have to set the. Uh, the chipset, so I can actually see it in the game. There's three slots you can uh, use. So if I switch to this one, you can see the HP gauge and XP and so on is uh, now gone from the HUD. But because I removed this now, I actually now have more power to, uh, more CPU power to delegate to these skills instead. So if we go back to the chips, I can uh, optimize this first. And I can start adding more of these attack uh, chips or a counter for instance you can see how this uh, takes us uh, spots in the uh, in the column there so if you are in a very big pinch in the game and you really need those extra points on the attack stats or the defense stats you do have the option to just take out some new elements you don't really need at that point and just delegate those uh, reserve points over to the uh, tech stats or, and so on, uh, put in more chips. And yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's just brilliant that uh, the game designers allows you to do this. Like, yeah, you can choose to uh, remove system information from the interface and thereby making the game harder for you in that manner, but you actually, you're becoming a stronger person in the game and then you can fight a bit um, better. So it's, it's, um, it's a fun way of um, moving this certain difficulty 
of, of one aspect of the game over to another one. Or um, removing something to increase the difficulty of the game in one aspect, like you don't have the system information anymore, or empathetic information as some people will call it. Uh, but you do get more powerful in the game, so you lose information, but you yourself become more powerful. So these sort of balance out, balance out each other in a certain way. And it's just brilliant that uh, you can do it. So we can just remove this chip and see what happens. So I'm sure many of you were maybe hoping for an explosion or something like this. Um, but we can actually do this uh, anyway in the game. So by clicking the left and uh, right um, thumbsticks, you can actually do this. So yeah, you don't fully die or anything, but it's pretty close. And, and if you're wondering what it's meant for, it's basically you can self-destruct to cause a lot of damage around you and you can take out a lot of enemies around you. And yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool thing. But yeah, since the game brought us back to this menu, we can continue from here. So as you know, when we design interfaces, we want to mitigate the risks so we don't put high risk and unfavorable operations uh, next to operations which uh, the users will engage with often and so on. So you don't, for instance, put the delete save uh, action next to the continue game action and so on. The game also does uh, many steps to avoid stuff like this, so we can have a look at them now. So here we are back at the main menu. We can go into the continue menu and then we get this screen. So there's uh, three items on top. There's a title. There's also this bar at the bottom. We can go into the new game menu and this is good now the game uh, tells us or informs us uh, how the game system works uh, with uh, with saving so we don't accidentally just quit the game and lose the progress but in this screen we can see that the new game is the exact same as the continued game the only difference is the uh, new game on top and otherwise it's the same thing so if I as a user wanted to continue the game, but I had accidentally gone into this menu with the new game and I push the X button, I now get a system message up here which informs me uh, what my current action is uh, will result in. So it informs me that if I continue now, I will delete the current save and create a new file. So this is uh, one way of uh, circumventing this risk. So um, people don't accidentally overwrite their saves. So in the next part of the video, I will just start a new game and we will just look at how the players learn the system and how the game layers the uh, different system information, like if it's inside integrated into the game, part of the narrative and fictional, or if it's on a superimposed layer on top of the game. So it's, uh, well, the game is very, the, actually the superimposed layer of the interface uh, is also fictional in the game, so, but you will see how it sort of divides this information between these two layers. Everything that lives is designed to end. We are perpetually trapped in a never-ending spiral of life and death. Is this a curse or some kind of punishment? I often think about the god who blessed us with this cryptic puzzle and wonder if we'll ever have the chance to kill him. This is command. Your husk 
Squadron, come in. 2B here. All units have penetrated the stratosphere. Autopilot systems green across the board. Okay, so uh, what's going on here? So we have an integrated element here with uh, this pop-up overlay, uh, which would have been like a... Um, it's not AR, it's definitely projected into the universe, as you can see with this small light beam right there. Uh, so in theory, this is something that is visible for all the characters within this game space. So usually, from what I've seen from most games, it's pretty common to put these elements as an overlay and superimpose on the screen. Uh, but for this, for some reason, the game has chosen to put this inside the game space instead. But I think it's a nice touch. This is Operator 6-0. It's confirmed. We so, <laughs> it's going to be a lot of back and forth here. But so these elements uh, are a bit different because they are perfectly perpendicular to the plane of the camera here. So. There is some tilting to them, but um, I think past the 50 kilometer threshold and are proceeding toward the target. Post. Understood. Once you reach their anti-air defenses, proceed to manual attack formation. Then destroy the Goliath class unit by any means necessary and gather what data you can. Understood. Twelve H down. All units activate manual mode and rely on visuals to evade. Already engaged. Free movement unlocked. Origin. So here we see how they actually put the. Uh, let me see. Yeah, there we go. Um, we can see how they put the uh, information very close to where the focal point was. So on you as a player, this also identified <laughs> who you were in the scene. Uh, so yeah, so the information is right there where the uh, the focus has to be for the game. It's a nice touch again. Point of long range lasers confirmed. <laughs> and uh, now we had the. Uh, so, yeah, now. 11B, okay, two point, two things there. Uh, we can go back a little Origin bit. Origin point, long range laser means necessary. To where and this character will be shot by the beam. <laughs> and then we go forth again to where we Origin unlocked point the. Of long range lasers confirmed. Uh, Ability here. So here, through uh, observational learning, we were able to predict the consequences of um, uh, not going out of the way of the beam. So it immediately gives us a bit of a challenge to uh, apply uh, this movement system for something uh, useful. Down. Which is to Our save your hands, are ineffective. Oh yeah, and then this messages. Um, so here we have a message which shows that uh, you don't have the authority to perform the command. So it does tell us um, again, similar to how the um, settings in the options were. Like you had these uh, uh, menu items which you could not use yet but you had some message on the bottom of the screen which told you why you couldn't use it and here you have a, another similar thing you have you can press the buttons on the controller and uh, the game simply informs you that you have the, it receives the input but you cannot perform this command for whatever it's going to be in the future is so here, if you look at the uh, balls here, you can see there have two different colors and one of them is uh, destroyed by the bullets and one of them is not. So this uh, gives us an opportunity and a fairly safe area, not too dangerous um, place in the game to be, to learn about the different properties of these two different balls. So by looking at the color and the, uh, the effect in within them, we start to learn which one we can destroy with bullets and which one we cannot. Multiple surrounding enemy air units confirmed. Requesting permission to assume mobile configuration. Permission granted.
So one thing I want to mention here, which is not very obvious because I don't have the controller input overlay on right now, but the controls between when you're moving around as a, as a player uh, and uh, when you're uh, operating these machines, the uh, input or the layout of your input is very similar between them, like which button you use to shoot with the, um, with the, with the bullets and uh, which button you use to do light attacks and which buttons you do to do heavy attacks and so on. And also use items to heal yourself and so on. These are all perfectly synchronous between all the different modes of play. So what I just did there, I um, use the menu to heal myself, and this is actually something that is not has not been taught yet um, within the game. This is something I knew because I have played the game before, so I had some previous experience. Um, so, uh, but I remember the first time I played the game, I died so many times in the uh, start of the game because I didn't know how to heal myself. And uh, this is something new, actually, because I'm pretty sure when I played it the first time, um, it, there is no auto-healing, uh, or there was no auto-healing, but now there is some auto-healing. So if I had a, let the health drop enough down, I would have been auto-healed uh, with a small recovery item. But this was not always the case. Captain, I think... 4B tap. So go a bit back here. So here we have an example why the the uh, earlier situation where we had um, a safer area to learn about the. The properties of the uh, balls, this uh, this balls flowing through the air, because here it's a lot more dangerous to learn about it because it's just way more of them. You have less, um, actually you have the same amount of axes, but now it's uh, flipped to the Y and uh, X instead of the X and Y. But um, there has been an, a noticeable increase in the difficulty uh, of uh, dodging these balls and at this particular location. Now here there's uh, more red balls and they come at different locations. Activating short range attack gear. Alert, large enemy group detected. Yes, I'm aware of that. So here we have a, a bit of a repetition between uh, what was already learned uh, with the um, flying robot. Uh, but it's just repeated for the player here, I think, just to really knock it in. But it's really the same buttons, like when I want to use the heavy attack with the robot, it was the Y. Um, the jump button is new though. You cannot jump with the, with the flying wingsuit uh, robot thing. So here we see a uh, bit of a visual effect here, where the uh, screen becomes very, di um, very uh, distorted when you reach this critical state of very low health. So we have um, a lot of effects here. We split the screen in multiple pieces and we move uh, pixels around. There seems to be... Um, it seems like the enemy models uh, are put are kept uh, some at the same place, it seems like, but the background elements are maybe shifted a bit more. I don't know if this is a, just a coincidence, but I can look at the pipes on the right, and they are very broken up. And I can look at the robot on the left, and he is very, even though there's there's uh, distortions in the color and the blur, um, the shape or his form whatever for, the pixel that forms his uh, contour uh, is persisting 
through the uh, distortion. Which would be probably hit to not make you lose uh, sight of what's going on or where the enemies are relative to you. So that play is game before, so I'm just running through it pretty quickly. And up next, there's a uh, a cool thing of how the interface is developed. To be, uh, ma'am. What is it? I was going to send you the map data I collected earlier. Do it. So this is how the map is uh, put into the game, or at least the mini map. The map itself is coming later. So it really puts an emphasis on uh, that all the visual um, overlay elements with the uh, HUD and all that is actually in the fiction and can be um, affected by whatever happens in the game. Things can be taken out depending on the state of your character. And now the sun is gone so I have no more natural light and the light in this room is going to be all over the place in editing. Adjust your settings so you can hear me, all right? Uh, adjust the settings until you can hear my voice. All right, are we good now? Okay, settings should all be good to go. That's pretty clever, right? And it does more than this, so uh, let's just keep going. Uh, hold on. Your self-destruct permissions are missing. Wait a sec, we need to restore those. I could set it for you, but you should probably do it yourself. Regulations and all, you know? Huh? Wait, no, you need to leave that turned on. Yeah, you can't really do that. It needs to be turned on except in very specific cases. I'm afraid I can't leave this as is, ma'am. Please give your permission. Hey, come on now. I'm just trying to follow regulations here. Hey, come on now. I'm just... Okay, good. If things go wrong during an op, you may have to sacrifice yourself in order to finish it. So, once you're finished making adjustments, you can go ahead and close this out. Morning. Yeah, so it was dark and then it became super bright and now we're back to dark again because this is how I edit my videos like a moron. Okay, so um, we can actually see in the image here that uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the 2B was standing next to you and helping with the interface there and um, you can actually see him standing next to the way he sees the interface so as you come out of your sleep. It's a very fun detail. So the next part of the video is actually kind of boring. It's just going through the different uh, menus, like the settings and options, and just breaking down how they work uh, with animation and uh, how they are layered and information design, basically. And it's, um, yeah, it's a little bit boring. So uh, you're free to skip this part. Yeah, you definitely don't have to watch this. It's pretty boring. Uh, kudos to you, actually. If you actually go through it, uh, kudos to you. I respect that. 
uh, so yeah, here it comes. So on the landing screen here, we have a nice big font with the game name. It has uh, some visual elements to it, which uh, is similar to the diegetics of the game itself. So there are some environments um, further in the game, which have something similar to this, uh, not to spoil too much. Um, but it's just to bring out the point that it's uh, thematically and uh, narratively and diegetically on point with uh, the game that's come. We can identify a bunch of layers here. We have a background layer. I'm not sure if this is a real 3D scene or if it's just an image. It looks kind of static, so it can definitely just be an image, a rendered image. On top of this, you have some um, dynamic elements. So you have these particles which are flying through the air. They are on two different layers. So you have something in the background where the focus of the uh, image is. There they are sharp, but in the foreground they are uh, also the sharpness plane of the uh, image. So they are very blurred, very soft. Uh, we can also identify there's like a grid that lies over the entire screen. There's a bunch of small rectangles within it. We can also see in on the stencils on the side here this um, this flowery uh, stencils, the grass. They don't have this grid pattern on top of them. It would seem unless the color just is so vivid that it cancels it out. But it seems like the grid is not visible on these. So that uh, informs us of how they have layered this um, the overlay technically. You can see it also on the title screen that uh, it has a beard on top of it. So the stencil is on top of the grid, the tiny bar underneath the selected items is also behind the grid. The text itself is over the grid, The uh, not the uh, near automata text, but the continue new game settings and so on. It's actually on top of um, this grid. So this would definitely be, would have been done because of legibility. So yeah, the font and the text has a solid color moving through it. You can also see they have used a drop shadow here. So the uh, text drops a shadow and that's actually very helpful here for uh, against the background. So against the white, white green background. Uh, without this uh, drop shadow, this continue text would have been very hard to read. You can also see some fun elements here uh, with the fuzzy distorted uh, duplication of the text. It seems to be the text that is duplicated and just distorted. So what, he, what they have probably done here is to use a UI shader and they just to replicate or uh, duplicate the, um, the text in the pixel shader and they just apply uh, some uh, distortion to it. And this uh, distortion is uh, just randomized with some values, I would assume to offset the pixels. And, and yeah, the the distorted thing would have been rendered before the uh, the text, so you can get the text solidly on top of the, uh, the noise. I can go into the settings. There was a nice transition here with uh, the motion, so everything had a slight motion to the right. And the settings also typed out um, over time. So there's a lot of nice animations happening here, which is not totally obvious upon first view, but you can go back and see them more. Uh, each uh, each uh, column item here had a slightly different timing on how it was pushed in from the side. You can see that again. So it just, uh, it just falls into place uh, incrementally, but it's very quick. You don't have to wait for much. It's just a pleasurable animation. We can also see how um, there's a similar animation in the text element at the bottom here. And also when you select a new item in the uh, list, there is a black bar or a box, a background, background box, um, which uh, animates. You have a very fast ease in, and then you have a curve that kind of slows down towards the end on the ease out. The text at the bottom here has exact same animation. Also, it's because of technical stuff, right? You don't want to create a lot of animations and uh, and so on. You preferably you want to reuse as many animation, animations as possible, so it is less work and it just creates a consistency in how uh, the experience is. 
we can go into the game settings here. So the bottom text is very helpful. It's uh, it gives explicit information as to why stuff does, uh, for instance, why stuff is unchecked. You can't uh, change them. Uh, I think many designers would uh, just take this out if um, they could not be changed here and just put them in a the game. But I think it's actually pretty helpful that. Uh, the, it informs the user that these options will become available at some point, but you cannot get them here. And it tells them why you can't do them or, and where you potentially can change them in the future. Uh, and it actually also fits in with the theme, like this computer AI theme of the game itself. So when we switch in the settings uh, setting, we use explicit text here. We don't have checkboxes. We use explicit uh, text as to if it's on and off. Okay, so oh yeah, so we can we can go back here and watch this again. And as I've uh, mentioned in many other videos, it is pretty important that these elements have some motion to them, because if they don't, uh, you probably won't notice them because the peripheral vision is mostly trained to detect un, uh, unexpected motions basically. And by having stuff fade in and out. And uh, you have um, some cyclic animation up there, where it goes in a pattern in a circle. Just having these uh, elements animate makes it so much easier for the peripheral vision and the parts of your brain which is tasked for uh, scanning for whatever in the uh, peripheral vision is able to pick up those notifications. So color-wise, the uh, screen, the setting screens and the menus in general are very uh, colorfully incomplex, but that's usually a good thing. So we can identify maybe two or maybe three colors here. So I can I can definitely just say that the background has this very light green, yellowish, uh, retro color, <laughs> like you maybe would, I don't know, I kind of associate it with uh, like a Game Boy. So like if Game Boy, screens became super high-tech and high-res, maybe they would uh, look something like this. But, um, so there's maybe two or three colors. So let's say the background has one color, you have uh, um, another lightness of the same color above here with the uh, adjust screen setting bar helper and the uh, screen button prompts background. Uh, it's their parent. Uh, you have repetitional use of the black color here in different opacities. So maybe it's just the same black color used again and again in different opacities across the screen. We also have some decorative elements. So the repetition of the three dots and the line. And um, so there's some structure to the page. We also have some background elements which uh, pulsate in and out uh, very softly, non-aggressively. So, and it, it's a nice uh, visual element which sort of pairs a little bit with the stringy background music. So if I listen to the background music, it seems like it's something like a, a harp with the reverb and very steel stringy, which you can sort of manipulate a bit in the uh, sound editor. So yeah, I tried to warn you that would be pretty boring. Uh, again, if you're still here, wow. <laughs> But uh, yeah, this is the end. Um, but I really like how this game works. I think it's how it dealt with interface and make it made it all fictional and on so many levels. It's uh, it's super cool to play this game, uh, particularly if you work with interface design and so on. And yeah, that's it for the video.